Hello, this is Ralph from Happy Dog Training. Let's talk about dog training models. What is a dog training model? So dog training models are basically the views of dog trainers on how dogs um, manage themselves in the world, how they communicate, how they react to things, how they respond to things, their view on dogs and how to train them. That's basically the dog, a dog training model. And the nature of models in general is that they are incomplete. So no model of a dog will ever be completely encapsulating the dog in its entirety. So maybe never say never. You know, we don't know when neuroscience will take us. But as of today, the models that we have available to us, they're not complete by their very nature. It's the nature of models to be incomplete. And the, the, let's start with the first model that really most people refer to who are uh, more in the behaviorist camp. And that, that's the a B.F. Skinner or the behaviorist. And the model is from the Skinner, Skinner died, I think, in the 1960s at some point. So in his life, he formed the model, the quadrant of operant conditioning, which contains terms like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment and negative punishment. And I don't want to get into those here today. We can talk about those some other times. But that model basically looks at the brain as a black box. We can't know what goes on inside, so let's ignore it. Let's focus on input and outputs. We do one thing and the dog responds in a certain way. We do another thing, the dog responds in a different way. That was behaviorism is. That is a view on dogs that explains a lot of things, but it is not complete. No model is. And it's, it's a model that's very persistent. And when people refer to themselves as science-based dog trainers, they want to focus only on one of those corners of the quadrant, which is positive reinforcement, and ignore all the others, while in reality they're using most of the others and just don't know how the things they're doing are actually called. But it is a model, and it is a model from the 1960s. So if you're calling yourself a science-based dog trainer, maybe the only science you're comfortable with shouldn't be 80, uh, 60 years old. Well, maybe, maybe some modern science would be helpful as well in addition to that model. I'll, I'll, so, well, actually, let's stay with this. So behaviorism was first, and then um, there were crazy things behaviorists believed. So, for example, Skinner believed that animals don't have emotions. That's crazy. Now, I mean, there's still people walking around who think that animals don't have emotions, but they obviously do. That's We know. <laughs> we know that animals or mammals have the same kinds of emotions. That's been well established. It's the neuroscience now. But then there are other things, as Skinner said, um, when a man, and obviously at that time it was a man, <laughs> uh, when a man think, says, I feel like going on a walk, that's not what he's saying. He is saying, I feel like I felt before when I went on a walk in the past. So according to behaviorists, we are just a uh, summary of our reinforcement and punishment history. Again, that's not accurate either. Huh? So there's gaps in that model by its very nature. Then cognitivism came along and cleaned up with a bunch of that stuff, um, the, the really crazy stuff. And then uh, next one was psychology, came with new models, new understandings, and cleared some of the cognitism things up. And now we actually have neuroscience. We are sticking ourselves and animals into MRI scanners and functional MRIs and see what goes on in the brain. We can measure life, uh, the um, release and diminishment of brain chemicals, of cortisol, of uh, uh, dopamine, of serotonin and things like that. We can actually see what goes on in the brain. The brain is no longer a black box, which is why behaviorism doesn't really uh, hold up in all aspects. There are things you just can't explain with that model. Now, another model is uh, the model on drives. And the, the classic view is there are different, there's pack drive, prey drive, and defensive drive, and there are trainers who talk about drives. And again, drives are a thing, and um, sports trainers will include prey drive, play drive, and there's other things. Some people will call food a drive, whatever all the drives may be. But that view, again, is built around a certain subset of the reality of a dog. So it's not incorrect, but again, it's, again, incomplete. Uh, and you you can't explain a biological being with a model today. There is no model 
that will um, hold up to scrutiny for a being in every context. There's always going to be things you can't explain with a model. You're going to be able to explain a good amount of things with a good model, but to say everything has to fit in this one model is just not going to be realistic. It's just never going to hold up. So any model that a dog trainer uses, if that is something rigid for them, if that is something they are not flexible on, something they're not willing to expand upon, is going to be very limited. So if somebody tries to squeeze every behavior he sees and every um, every training he does and everything he's trying to adjust or fix with a dog into this one particular model, there's going to be limits in, in, in the effectiveness. So you have to have a broader understanding of, of multiple models and then also factor in some of the newer things that we specifically learn through neuroscience. Neuroscience has made a big difference in many ways. So the way I view dogs, for example. Huh? Oh, there's one more that I wanted to mention. Um, the, the, the pack, the view of packs, the pack model, that's also very prevalent. It's kind of related to the drives. Usually people who believe in the pack structure also believe in drives. And and I believe is the wrong. I mean, view dogs through the lens of drives, I should say. It's not a belief system. These, these things are not fantasy. They're real. They're just limited. But the, the, the thing with packs is, Yes, wolves form packs. Yes, dogs can form packs. Yes, there are hierarchies. All these things are obviously true, but they depend on context. So dogs are not wolves and wolves are not dogs and forming packs is not going to happen under all circumstances. You need to have a certain number of dogs and you can have forced packs and you can have natural packs and the structure and hierarchy yes, exists, but it's not absolute and it couldn't shift. There are always going to be things that don't fit in that model. So, for example, uh, in a wolf pack, the most skilled hunter, if that is not the pack leader of that wolf pack, will take over for the hunt. So the, the pack leader will surrender his role to the most skilled hunter to take over for the hunt, and then afterwards it switches back. During this entire time, there is no confusion of who's in charge of the pack. During the hunt, it's just run by someone else. But the ultimate boss is still the pack leader of that pack. So there, there, is, uh, there is no confusion um, as to who the leader is just because of who is running at that moment. Uh, somebody who's most qualified for the task of catching the prey and surviving is going to take over. That's just smart. So, But that doesn't fit into the, in the traditional view of there is a pack leader who controls everything. Right? Now the pack leader is surrendering for the hunt to another dog, or a wolf in this case. Um, so these models are limited. These models have gaps. And all of these models have truth in them. They're just not absolute. And that's, that's the thing. Huh? So the model I personally look at, it's a relationship-based, a motivational model. I view dogs as partners. I view them as family members. And I don't humanize them, but I understand what is the same and what is different um, between a dog and a human. So, for example, if you look at the brain in, simplified, uh, in a little more simplified manner and say there's basically three layers in there. One is the lizard brain, and then the next one is the limbic system with all the emotions, and then we have the neocortex. And the limbic, uh, the the the, um, the, the, uh, the lizard brain is something we literally share with a lizard. So that part is responsible for habits and automotive responses, uh, automotive functions, and we share that with all animals. Now the next part, the limbic system, where the emotions are located, all mammals share the same emotional systems. So emotions function in dogs the same way they function in a mouse, a horse, a cat, a human. Yes, we're not that special. Below the neocortex, we're not that special from a cognitive perspective. Now, obviously, we can talk, a dog cannot, but a dog can experience the same emotions of fear and panic and, and rage that a human can. He just can't express it the same way. So you will see reactivity in a dog and you see aggressive behavior in a dog uh, because he can't express the emotion he's experiencing in a different manner. Um, so the expression is going to be different, but the internal experience is not. So we have learned a lot through uh, neuroscience in the last couple of years that shown us how, how different animals and, and dogs are, actually are from what we used to think they are. We've learned a lot. We've expanded a lot. 
And I think it's important to, to not lose sight of that when we discuss dog training and dog training models. Now, my personal view on dogs is, as I said, it's a partnership-based view. I'm a motivational trainer. I uh, would say positive first would be probably the best approach to describe it. And that's a term coined by Glenn Cook from the Canine Paradigm. I like that term. I'm going to kind of use it. And that doesn't mean pure positive. It doesn't mean positive only because that is silly. There is no such thing as a pure positive trainer. And I know that people call themselves that, but they're not. They're using things like negative reinforcement, negative punishment. But pure positive doesn't exist. right? So but I would say positive first. I'll try to motivate the dog. I try to get the best performance and motivation. Doesn't mean there couldn't be a correction somewhere down the line after I've taught it to uh, the maximum extent and I know this clear, the dog can do it. There's no confusion. I've motivated him enough. He still doesn't want to do it. Yeah, maybe there's a correction, but it's not the first go-to. It's not the quick fix. It's not the cranking up I want to do. So I'm a motivational trainer first. I try to get the performance from my dog because he wants to do it for me, because he wants to perform. I want to form a relationship with a dog and I want the dog owners to have a relationship with their dog. So uh, motivational first is how I, how I look at the way I train dogs. So I view dogs as partners. I want to motivate them to the best of their abilities. I want to get the best performance out of them. I want them to want to do it for me. Mm -hmm. I want to help them learn how to navigate the world, um, give them tools to ask for help, and um, then obviously get help from me or from their owners when they need help, when they're a little uh, intimidated by what goes on in the environment. And I want them to learn how to, how to maneuver the world safely alongside of alongside of us and um yep yeah, that's my goal in training with all my clients um ideally i would like to see every dog i train to be able to be trusted at liberty that is a goal i adapted from um jay jack and chad Mackin. i think it's a wonderful goal it's the north star it doesn't mean we're gonna get there with many dogs it depends on a lot of factors many factors and but that's the north star i want every dog to become the best version of themselves i want them to be as good as they can be, progress as much as they can, and I will help owners as much as they want help. And uh, I will give them 100% of what they're going to put in as well. So that that's, that's my view on dogs, that's my view on training dogs, and that's how I look at dogs. So dog training models taken with a grain of salt, acknowledge what is factual about them, what we actually know, and know what the gaps are and where else to fill how else to fill the gaps mm -hmm. and if somebody wants to stick with a model and say everything fits in there keep looking move forward move on not the person you want to probably have your dog trained by no model is rigid no model is absolute that is very basic it's the nature of models in general that has nothing to do with dog training models are a a way to describe part of reality that's relevant to a specific topic they can never be all inclusive they can never be complete it is extremely unlikely that that's going to be the case but i hope that was informative and i'll talk to you next time another car video uh, i'd film these between sessions and that's why they're in the car i hope you like the format and um we keep doing more of these